Hello, and welcome to session 79 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. I have a few quick announcements to make, and then we will get right to our program today. Uh, first of all, this podcast is brought to you by HRIC. Barb Voss can help you find your dream job, or if you're an agency, your dream candidate. So to learn more, go to hricolorado.com forward slash contact. And this show is also sponsored by the Essential for Living Assessment and Curriculum. So get free shipping on all purchases until June 1st by using discount code, ready for this, EFLBOP0501. Okay, I recognize that most of you probably don't have a pencil and paper at the ready. More than likely, you're driving around doing chores, walking the dog, etc. So go to the show notes for this episode where, uh, where you'll find a link to the Essentials for Living website along with this discount code. And then lastly, the New Hampshire Association for Behavior Analysis is hosting Dr. Solande Forte on April 19th from 9 to 12 in Bedford, New Hampshire for a CEU event. The title of this event is Navigating Through Cultural Barriers in Applied Behavior Analysis. And this event is good for three ethics CEUs. Again, for links to this event, simply go to the show notes for this episode or visit nhaba.net. Okay, on to today's show. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Merrill Winston about the topic of mass shootings. During our chat, Merrill mentioned that mass shooting events are just things that will continue to happen. And sadly, his words were prescient. Because a few days later, uh, after we recorded this conversation, the horrific and unspeakable events in New Zealand took place. I I suppose the tenor of our discussion would have been more somber if the timing were reversed, and I genuinely apologize if we came off as uh, unserious at times or tone deaf, and I guess I'm just more so speaking for myself. Um, Anyway, I think that this is an episode that bears a lot more discussion. If this is something that you want to hear more about, there are other behavior analysts who have looked into this topic, and I'm more than happy to schedule additional interviews on this, uh, this uh, subject. So, um, despite the sad nature of this uh, subject matter, I hope you find Merrill's analysis of these events uh, very interesting, and it, for me, it kind of served as a model of looking at a variety of events outside of our typical scope of practice. Uh, and again, I, th- I hope you find the, these things uh, as interesting as I did. So without any further delay, please welcome Dr. Merrill Winston. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Merrill Winston, thanks for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? Good, good. Doing well. How are you doing, Matt? I am fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for joining me again. This has been a uh, long overdue podcast. You <laughs> have been a, a much requested guest, and I'm really happy we had a chance to finally sit down and chat. So, Yeah, me too. It's, it's going to be awesome. We have a lot of things to dig into here, but first I want to hear how you got into behavior analysis, how you discovered it, and what made you think about, hey, this could be something I can do for a living. Um, I was at uh, University of Florida uh, as an undergraduate uh, about 1979, um, which, you know, there's no way I could get into it if I applied today. You know, that was back in the day when they accepted anybody with a pulse uh, and who lived in Florida. So it's a bit different now. But um, I took all the introductory psych classes and, um, you know, and I was interested in psychology. I, I thought I was going to go into psychology in some manner. I didn't know exactly what. And then I had my first um uh, applied behavior analysis class. It was the first introduction to behavior analysis other than what I saw in a general textbook. Uh, and my first teacher was Hank Pennypacker. And, oh, nice. uh, so as soon as I, as soon as he opened his mouth to talk, like, I don't know, five minutes into the class, I'm like, this is what I'm doing because everything he said, not only was he really funny and brilliant, but everything he said made perfect sense to me. And, uh, I looked at a dude, my friend David Lubin, who I went to school with, and we happened to have all the same core courses. We were in all the same classes and we looked at each other and we were like, 
yes, this is the, this is the one. Cause, you know, we had kind of taken a sampling of all the psychology courses, right? And then we saw this and I was like, oh, that's it. Boom. And, uh, that was pretty much it after that. So um, the hook was I, set. The hook was set. It was that course and everything made like perfect sense, you know, that he said. Uh, so yeah, I just loved it after that. And then I just took more courses. I took all the core courses and then realized that's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, Florida must have been kind of, uh, uh, you know, had a lot of behavior analysis going on at that point in time. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about the environment uh, in general? You obviously yeah. you mentioned Hank, but obviously there yeah. are many other you know, luminaries the, the, in our the, field. The people, yeah, the people there at at the program, you know, that I had access to at least a little bit. Uh, Mark Branch did a lot of behavioral pharmacology. Oh yeah, um, they did a lot of shock maintained behavior studies. They did a lot of studies uh, rats, animals, pigeons. Um, a lot of adjunctive. Uh, research came out of the University of Florida. I used to run pigeons, actually, in the adjunctive attack uh, study. And um, who else was there? Jim Johnston was there, who, of course, was was one of Hank's students. And Jim became my professor at Auburn University. Um, other people there, uh, E.F. Malagoti. Um, I could tell you what the F stands for, but not on this podcast. All right, all right, uh, that'll that'll be on the uh, <laughs> the blooper reel. But, but, but that's that's kind of a joke for those who know uh, Ed Malgoti. Uh And he had a great lab there and did a lot um, did uh, and a lot of animal research. Um, and you know the applied stuff. This was back in the day. This was before functional analysis. So this was. This was more like a, you know, really applied behavior analysis, behavior modification. Yeah. There, there wasn't really, there wasn't any talk of function of behavior or escape maintained behavior, anything like that, really. Most things were, that were done were procedural back then. That was, they were just kind of blind procedural stuff. Um, Hank told us of an example, Brian, the kid who bit his arm. The treatment was every time he bit his arm, they tied it behind his back for like five minutes or something. And this and and this was and this was this was back in the day. This was a standard thing to do. And uh, at the time, Hank was pretty proud of it. And so but, you know, and it worked. It actually decelerated the behavior really well. But by today's standards, that's not what we would do. At least we wouldn't jump right to it. But that was kind of. That's where it came from. I mean, that's where all treatment came from, where things were done more what what they would call methodological behaviorism, which Hank is not a methodological behaviorist. But back then, it was more throwing procedures at stuff. And sure. I think that's where it came out. of, And that's why so many people criticize us today, because they think that our behavior analysis is our father's behavior analysis, which it kind of isn't. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that's a great example. Of, you know, one of the things I like to do on this show is, uh, especially when I speak to practitioners like yourself who've been at this for a while, is to share a little bit of history with the people who are out there doing the work today and in school today, learning about this stuff, because it's such a different scene. It's like just orders of magnitude difference. So that just that little example right there encapsulates, you know, the, uh, yeah. the maturation and, and of the field. <laughs> and just to be clear, Hank was awesome. And had they not done that, this kid would have torn his arm up. I mean, they, they stopped it really well. It's so I don't want, uh, neophytes in the field thinking, Oh my God, Hank was bad. No, yeah. Hank was doing great work. And it's just that this whole idea of function hadn't uh, – some people had probably already understood this. I'm sure they did. There's a lot of brilliant people in the field before um, Brian Iwata espoused this. But certainly there was no formal functional analysis or you know standard. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, they had, those techniques had not been uh, uh, illuminated fully yet. So. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Jim Johnson, uh, also my major professor as well at Auburn. Uh, and uh, uh, right. so, so how did you, uh, how did you, how did, did you both, did both of you go to Auburn? Like kind of, yeah, at we the are same both, time? We're, yeah, the, the, the lie I tell people is I got accepted to Auburn and Jim followed me, but oh, uh, well, that makes perfect sense. It, it happened at about the same time. I ended up doing some um, research on repeated acquisition on children with autism in Johnson's lab. They had a big one big room as a human operant chamber and we ran kiddos in that and I worked with him on that um, and I also did some of the rumination research that Jim was doing at uh, Sunland Gainesville so I was working on that with him there and then when I went to Auburn I also worked on some of it with him at Auburn 
So I have the dubious honor of counting more ruminations than any human being on the planet. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Not proud of it, but. Well, you know, I, I think, those- <laughs> you know, Jim, when I interviewed Jim way, way, way back in the early days of the podcast, um, and we talked about this very briefly, but I, I think it's important if, if you don't mind kind of elaborating on this, Meryl, sure. uh, the, the contribution that that body of research provided for the treatment of rumination. I mean, he had like a 10 year, you know, yeah. federally funded grant, yeah. um, not one grant, but I'm sure a series of them, but yes. you know, a, a long story short, a long body, a, a large body of research on this topic that really helped shape how we go about assessing and treating this very, very dangerous behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, the studies were done for on a lot of, uh, for a long time with a lot of parameters. Um, and it's, uh, mostly, uh, you know, in the uh, population of people that are more profoundly developmentally delayed, usually nonverbal, typically rare to find somebody that was high functioning who ruminated. Um, so yeah, we did that for quite some time. Um, I think, and I did, uh, I think I was author on like a couple of, uh, papers um that were that were published but yeah it was uh, probably the biggest thing we got was satiation quantity meals low calorie high bulk um probably like, did more than anything else like popcorn and rice cakes and things like that uh yeah sometimes we would load them up with green beans uh and uh, oh, when boy. i say and when i say load them up i mean i mean the first the first refusal was kind of like <laughs> it was kind of like this. Um, they, they had to have three refusals, and uh, then we said they were satiated. But, um, yeah, we did a lot of satiation uh, meals with the individuals, and that cut it down better than anything still. I I Although there's other treatments, you know, uh, I'm sure I haven't kept up with it lately. I do know that it's still a, a problem, but most people, I would say, don't run into it. Um, it is. It can be. Uh, life threatening, not any one instance, but, you know, esophageal tears and oh, yeah. tooth erosion are the biggest ones. For sure. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. So, so what made you, so after, so you, the hook was set, you're, you're working with Jim at Auburn. Um, you know, kind of take us from there up to what you're doing today for a living. <laughs> So what um, I also worked part time as a behavior program specialist at Sunland Gainesville. And the first person I worked with had extremely severe self injurious behavior. He spent most of his day tied in um, a chaise lounge in the in his living room at home in four point restraint and in which he was happy as a clam. He loved it. Um, But that was the first kid I worked with. And uh, so I did that for about a year, um, just like part time while I was still taking classes. Then I got accepted to Auburn started working with Jim, doing some rumination research. Um, I did my master's on pica uh, behavior. And um, uh, I also did my my dissertation. I changed gears because I needed it to be easier to get approval. Um, so I used college students. And I did it on rule-governed behavior, which I'm still very interested in today. And I, I hadn't been for a long time. But when I started doing things with higher functioning people, rule governed behavior started coming back in again. So I was always very interested in that. And, uh, that was, um, that was what I did my dissertation on. After that, um, when I graduated, um, my first job was the senior psychologist at a large developmental center, uh, in Opelika, Florida, Miami, uh, Southwest Miami, uh, Northwest Miami, I'm sorry. And, um, that was called Landmark Learning Center, but it was one of the, uh, Florida four state facilities that used to be called Sunland. And uh, so I was there for about nine years and that's where I, you know, kind of got in the trenches and, uh, got dirty and learned a lot about what works, what doesn't staffing issues and i worked with a lot of what people would call now institutional behavior which is long-standing really dangerous behavior that tends to proliferate in those kinds of settings that you maybe don't see it as severe anymore yeah that was my Um, first real job was working in a setting like that so I, i i can certainly imagine the scenario yeah very uh well entrenched behaviors with uh, long histories of reinforcement associated with them, not a lot of good interventions and, you know, prior to any type of sophisticated behavioral treatment, right, et cetera. Right. And just like a lot of quality of life issues that, oh, yeah. you know, even if you had a good intervention, their life sucks. And uh, so, yeah, you have that. 
Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. Um, and so what is uh, what is your day job right now? The day job now is, and what I've been doing since... Um, 2002, that's when I started with PCMA, is I work for the Professional Crisis Management Association. So I'm the director of program development. So I do a lot of uh, development of the materials. I do the videos. Um, I do the training of our four-day instructor course that teaches them how to do crisis intervention um, restraint procedures and also how to de-escalate people and prevent crisis. Uh, but I do a lot of um, – I do consultations as well, like full day consultations. I'll, they'll call me out to some place that they're having difficulty. Uh, I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements uh, now, uh, and so I also do a lot of expert witnessing in cases involving crisis management gone awry, or uh, IEP meetings, or disagreements over teams, or due process. Uh, most of the cases I do now have something to do with restraint. Um, sometimes they involve fatality. Sometimes they involve injuries. Sometimes they involve claims of traumatization. Um, and I seem to be doing more of those lately, representing both um, parents uh, and facilities that are getting uh, sued. So I've, I've done about equal amount, both sides of these uh, cases. Yeah. So that's what, that's what I that takes up most of my time. And of course, the trainings when I do them, I travel, and that's at least four or five days away from home. Um, so I do several of those per year, at least, at least six of those per year. Okay. Um, yeah. Pretty cool. So you probably have, uh, so there's so many directions we could go in. I, I I think we probably need to do an entire episode just on restraint. It's an issue that, uh, as a school based consultant, (laughs) I, I see all the time that, that, that districts really struggle with, uh, and things like that. Uh, certainly be another one, <laughs> certainly just the, the, the idea of staff training with someone like yourself who, who basically does that as a, a large part of their, their work, mm-hmm. so many directions we can go into, but we'll have to put the, put a, put a, I guess a cork in that for some other day, because today we're going to be talking about your, I guess, conceptual work in, uh, the mass analyzing shootings. mass shootings yeah. and things along those lines. So this is something that, uh, is, is is a topic that you're you know you speak about and you've again as I mentioned at the outset of, the, of our chat here people have requested that you come on and talk about this uh, specifically so great my, my first question I guess in this topic is uh, how, what what made you become interested in this and um, how, how did you start I guess trying to figure out how to how to analyze or conceptualize these these events. Okay. Uh, as most of the talks that I do, most of the talks I do start off with me getting angry about something. <laughs> and that's usually my motivation. So instead of taking it out on people, I try to turn it into something productive. And what I was angry about was not just that these shootings kept happening. Um, I was angry about, which is typical of the media, um, the, the gross oversimplification of what people think the problem is and people bickering over something that they're certain is the problem when I am just as certain that it isn't. And so – and those things that people are certain of, it is uh, that guns cause the problem. And when I say cause the problem, 
I mean, people think they cause it in a root cause sense. And that's one thing that I want to correct people's thinking on. They don't cause this problem. They allow it to become as bad as it is, and we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. um, but not cause in the sense of a root cause, which we can talk about later. The other part was the mental illness part. And I really took issue with that as well, saying, well, it's just, you know, it's mental illness. It's mental illness. And and the what everybody, what is thrown at everyone, the population is, if you are a gun proponent, then you throw it at mental illness and say, well, it's clearly not guns. There's just some crazy people. And if you are against guns, then, you know, you tend to say more that, well, it's a gun problem. And even though people will acknowledge mental illness, but mental illness is this giant gray area that everyone retreats to when they don't understand what's happening. Um, and so that's kind of not that it can't play a role. But I think that people are uh, have been like really, really misled about that. So those were those were kind of the things that it would it would come up in the media and then there'd be a big discussion of nothing that would happen. And, you know, the, the gun control stuff, I started getting kind of upset about that, too, because you, what you see pretty quickly is it's not that quick to get gun control. And any gun control you get is not really the kind of control that people would like. It's it's, you know, and that historically it hasn't been. Um, so, you know, and that I thought the problem was not really well understood and that, you know, yeah, guns figure into it. There's no question about that. Uh, and um, and I'll get into the, the details on that uh, for sure. But mental health, that's not nearly, you know, unless you change the concept of what mental health is. And I have this discussion with someone that, you know, if you have zero empathy for someone, does that mean you're mentally ill? Well, I think you're kind of stretching the definition of what that is. And so, you know, that's – anyway, that's what kind of got me into it is like what everybody's suggesting is the problem. This is not the problem. I see. All right. And, so you, you, know, and, so you yeah. were looking for a more nuanced, uh, 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 more sophisticated type of analysis of these events. So uh, Something that was more overarching and tied these events into events we already understand. I see. You know, to, to, to make it – I wanted to make it more understandable because for so many people, the question they ask is how could someone do this? And I wanted to, I wanted to be able to explain how somebody could do this. Got it. And Got it. Without appealing to mental illness. So, so when an event happens, uh, how, how do you go mm -hmm. about kind of conceptualizing, you know, the, that, uh, the set of, uh, I guess, events to – answer that question you know so not not just the how but what are the conditions necessary yeah, for yeah. this to happen yeah, yeah. perhaps is so you know the, a more the, precise you know, what I did way was, of looking I, at it. I looked at different types of um they call it gun violence and a lot of people don't like that phrase and oh by the way just to get this out here i am a gun owner i'm not a gun nut i have a lot of them but only because i grew up around always wanting them and thinking they were cool from when i was a kid i don't hunt i go to the range occasionally I have a concealed weapons permit, but I don't carry. I just never found it really necessary. And actually, if you've ever had a concealed weapon permit, the first thing you realize is it's such a tremendous responsibility. I don't even want it. Yeah. It's just it's 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 you bring you bring danger wherever you go is one of the concepts. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, to, yeah. To put just to be transparent here, too. I, I um I live in rural New England and, you know, of like the 30 or so houses on my street, you know, probably about 25 of them have multiple guns in them. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've got friends with, uh, with AR 15s and they love it. They're like Lego sets because like, they, they, buy, uh, they buy all the yeah. parts online. They assemble it's them. It's a dude thing. It's such you know, a, it's such uh, a, people don't, it's a dude thing. And people, I mean, you know, some women get into it too, not to be sexist, but it's, it's a, you know, I like them like I like toys. It's, it's just, I, I don't take them out and shoot them usually. And mostly lately I haven't even gone to the range and I don't know how long, but anyway, it's like, um, it's like having a nice guitar collection, you know, it's yeah, like, it's, it's like, do you, do you play every day? No. Yeah, and are they expensive? No. Yes. And the way, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, but they're there, you know, in case of the zombie apocalypse, but uh, also I'll be the first one to say, I have no problem with any restriction the government wants to do. I'm fine. I, I'm one of the more reasonable gun owners. Like I have an AR-15. I'll never use it. I'll never use it. And I don't need it. And if the government wants it, fine. But you won't hear a lot of gun owners saying that. I really don't care. I really don't care. Mm -hmm. Small clip size, fine. I don't care. Whatever you want to limit. 
Um, in fact, I'm all for making restrictions as tight as humanly possible, which you don't hear a lot of gun owners say. I, I would like there to be insane restrictions. But anyway, um, I don't think it's going to happen. Not in my lifetime. Yeah. And this is this is one of the one of the issues. But anyway, as far as um, what I started looking at for the necessary, we call it. So in behavior analysis and in science in general, we look for what we call necessary and sufficient conditions. So to really say we understand something, because when you understand everything that is both necessary and sufficient, then we say you understand the phenomenon pretty well. So what I was trying to find out is what's necessary for these mass shootings and you know, one of the things in common, well, the, the first, the th- three big things are one, there has to be a motivator. You don't just pick up a gun and start shooting just because there's nothing on television. There's, there's always a motivator. There's some kind of motivator. That's one. Um, two, uh, another factor. And this factors into, by the way, all kinds of crime. Um, neut- what I call neutralized aversives. And that is, these are things that are aversive to the majority of the population, but either temporarily or permanently are no longer aversive to the individual in question. And this is incredibly important. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to them. So that is, uh, as an example, most people are afraid of going to jail. Not everybody is. And m- there's many things that people might do but they fear jail, so they don't. Uh, there are some people who only fear it a little bit. There are some people who fear it tremendously. There are some people who don't fear it at all. And so these are, you know, and there's going to be a whole continuum. So neutralized aversives would be one. Um, the other one would be a lack of empathy for others. That is, seeing others harmed or unhappy is aversive to you. That's kind of one of the characteristics. I'm not going to give a whole definition of empathy because it means a lot of different things to different people. But behaviorally, in a nutshell, if you're empathetic, uh, you kind of tend to feel what other people feel. So you might have and it might be an unconditioned response. Like if a parent sees their child crying, the parent might start to cry. And there's some probably some classical conditioning going on in that. Right. That is, you feel what they feel. Mm-hmm. When you see them, that would be like the number one of empathy. I feel what you feel. You hurt. I hurt. You're you're um, you're uh, overjoyed. I am overjoyed. Uh, that kind of a thing. So if you have low empathy for others, like somebody else hurts and it means zero to you, that's a big problem. Another possible one is not just that you have no empathy, but you even have an aberrant reinforcer like a bully. You like to see other people suffer. So that would be not simply no empathy, but you actually enjoy watching people suffer like the bully. So, you know, I wouldn't just say the bully has lacks empathy, but the bully actively seeks making people unhappy which is a little bit different. So this, you know, lacking empathy is extremely important. Um, so it would be kind of those big critical variables. You got your motivator, you got your neutralized aversive, you got a lack of empathy. Um, another one would be, um, uh, which contributes to these neutralized aversives, uh, would be um, essentially um, not having a lot of reinforcers, no good reason to live, no no things to live for. This would be like nothing that you love so much you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to put that thing at risk by doing something dangerous. So like there's something in life or someone in life you love so much you you would not engage in certain dangerous things because you would lose those things, right? So. These are the things that I noticed, and and one of the reasons that I got interested in mass shootings is I was also interested in terrorism and why terrorism happens. And what I found is there's a lot of analogies. They're not exactly the same, but there's many similarities between school shootings and acts of terrorism. They're like they're like cousins. I see. Very very similar. Very similar. Um, and what I tried to do was take these concepts of. You're motivated. You have some neutralized aversives. You have a lack of empathy or complete lack or selective act, lack of empathy. And um, you have things in your life, reinforcers in your life, what we might call, you know, full life factors or quality of life, quality of life factors. So, you know, do you have family? Do you have friends? Do you have love interests? Do you have hobbies? All these things. And I listen at the end of the talk. We can get into them. But um, so I started looking at these at different kinds of homicide, right? And 
terrorism is so similar because this is what I tell people when people say like they used to say like uh, terrorists and this is related to the school shooting. Terrorists are crazy. Terrorists are crazy. Um, they're insane. Actually, they're not. And there is a, um, a book called What Terrorists Want. And I'm going to give you the um, I'm going to give you the reference, uh, the author's name. I just have to look it up real quick. Uh, yeah, we can put it in the show notes uh, if, if you can't put your fingers on it right away. Uh, yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, I can. It's um, I'm sorry, Louise Richardson, Louise Richardson. And the book is called What Terrorists Want. And what what what's interesting is that um, she called the, the there are three R's in terrorism and they are revenge, renown and reaction. Revenge is you killed our people. We're going to kill your people. That's straight up revenge. Renown is uh, CNN picks up the story. Now you're famous. Now your name gets out there. Reaction is you provoke your adversary into taking some action as a consequence of your terroristic act, pulling out of a country or something like that I or see. changing your stance on something. And that's what she was saying. She actually interviewed a bunch of terrorists. And one thing she found is terrorists are not crazy, which makes perfect sense. They are military, ISIS, military, right? They are organized. They do not want crazy people. They cannot trust crazy people. They have to carry things out in a very detailed, specific way, Right. You know, you've seen all the movies and you've seen Homeland and you've seen stuff. Terrorists are organized. Like if it's something like ISIS, they're not crazy. They're not crazy. Yeah, they would never get they anything ha- done. They would never get anything done. They have different values than we do. They have selective empathy. So let me let me explain using like the, the things I just talked about. And then we'll talk about like school shooters. So like with terrorists, they have what's called um, highly selective empathy. Um, for an entire population. It's selective non-empathy. So if you're in the United States, everyone in the United States is evil. Women, children, it doesn't matter. You're all in the United States. You're all evil. You all deserve to die. Okay. This is highly selective empathy. If you are, if you are part of us, if you are in our nation with our religion, then you are good and you should be protected. Right. Um, so it's not that they don't have empathy for their own children or the children of other families in their community. They have zero empathy for our children. So in that regard, uh, they do have this lack of empathy. It, uh, we'll kill you. You don't matter. You don't matter. Only we matter. Right. And the U.S. is like that towards the terrorist. Terrorist, you should die. You should die. We're going to kill you. Right. And what we're saying to the terrorists, your lives don't matter either. Right. So everybody devalues everybody's life Mm -hmm. and kind of this is part of the problem. Like I don't devalue terrorist lives. I don't want them to die. I want them to stop. (laughs) Okay, I don't need them to die. I don't need them to die. I have no personal vendetta with them, even though some people might say they deserve to. My point is I value everybody's life. And if I could, I wouldn't want them to die. I just want them to stop. I just want them to stop. Like justice would be another issue, right? But this is the the point is is that we have this back and forth of this selective empathy. And we by the way, we teach it to our children. So if you're on death row, you deserve to die. You should die, right? It's okay if you die, you're bad. That's an example of selective empathy. We don't care if you die. Well, it doesn't matter because you deserve no empathy because of what you did. And what we teach our children is it's okay if we kill some people. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what it is. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not being judgy. No, you're, you're saying, coming at it from an, just a just a analytical perspective. I, I am a visitor from another planet, and I am observing your ways. And what I see is I see parents tell their children it doesn't matter if some people are killed. It's okay. And our government says it. So like murder, um, if it's self-defense. You're still murdering someone, but it's not called homicide. Okay. It's not called murder one. If it's self defense, you still killed somebody, right? But the government says, well, that's okay. That's okay. Cause they were going to kill you. You're allowed to stand your ground, right? Military. They're allowed to kill people. Hiroshima. They were allowed to kill a whole bunch of people. There's, there is both sanction in society. There is sanctioned and unsanctioned murder. So when we sanction it, we're like all cool with it. Right. Go kill the terrorists. That's still selective empathy. You know, it's still that's still kind of 
operating in there. So anyway, the terrorists have the selective empathy. They clearly have a motivator. You you did a smart bomb on a hospital and killed our children. You used your children as human shields. We don't care. You killed our children, whatever. But they so they still have a motivator, right? Um, the other one is they also have neutralized aversives. Uh, the people, not all terrorists, not the people at high levels, the recruits, the terrorists they get, they're willing to kill themselves. They, 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 they may fear death in some manner, but not so much that it'll stop them from carrying out the act of terrorism. So they have a reduced fear of death, which would be a neutralized aversive, right? That is in common with the school shooters. What's different? The motivation is different usually. The school shooter is not usually trying to make a political statement. So like, uh, you know, the kids, uh, Dylan Klebold, um, uh, and the, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, which shooting was that? The, uh, um, Columbine. Thank you, Columbine. In the Columbine shooting, they even said it had to do with them being bullied and harassed by the other kids. They were going to get them back. They weren't making a political statement that the United States should pull out of Afghanistan. OK, that's their motivators were different, but their lack of empathy right on target. They, they had zero empathy for the people that they were going to kill. Zero. Um, and so they also had neutralized aversives. Most of the school shooters I can't get into their mind and say what they were planning, but it looks like for most of them, they were either planning to kill themselves or willing to kill themselves or at least knowing they might be killed when they do this act. I don't think there was any shooter that went into any of these schools thinking there's no way I'll get killed. I mean, I'm sure all of them knew they could be killed and some of them may have been planning to kill themselves. So it's kind of another issue. Um, so, uh, but that, do you understand, do you see how there's some similarity between oh, yeah. like the school shootings and the terrorism? Sure. And, and what, what it really has to do with is these people personally, they did nothing to me. Like for the, for the Columbine, that's a little different. They actually went after people who were mean to them, like jocks. And they even said some of this in their statements, these guys are going to pay. So there are times where it is more focused so like a workplace shooting, usually they go back and they shoot the people that fired them. Yeah, I think that just and, happened and, a couple of weeks ago. And it's going to happen again. And it's not going to stop happening anytime soon. This is the other bad news. Um, and so that's a little bit different in that they are not just indiscriminately saying, I just want a high body count and I want to be famous for doing the horrible thing. That wasn't what they were doing. Some of the school shooters even said stuff like, I want to break so-and-so's record. I want to get a higher body count, right? That's different. Mm. It's a bit different in motivators. So, you know, when I'm looking at them, I'm categorizing them based on, okay, um, what was the alleged motivators? And sometimes it has something to do with, you know, rejected by a love interest. They were teased. They were made fun of any, a variety of things. And then I look at, um, did they kill themselves? That is was suicide part of it. Um, and, uh, the other ones looking at, um, how selective was it? So were they just indiscriminately shooting anybody or did they go to a particular classroom? Cause that's, that is, um, the ones where people are, are specifically targeting individuals, even though it's a mass shooting, that is more similar in motivation to a typical revenge shooting. You slept with my wife. I'm going to kill you. You fired me. I'm going to kill you. That is you did something to me. And I want to kill you, not not anybody else. I have zero empathy for you. The person did something to me with a lot of the school shooters. They kill people that never did anything to them. That's like that's more like a terrorist. So a terrorist, it's more like it's more like racism in that it's global. Like, well, you're an American, right? So you deserve to die. Yeah, I know. But I never did anything to you. It doesn't matter. You're an American. You deserve to die. And that's what a lot of these school shooters are saying about these all these other kids. I mean, they could even be saying something like, you all are happy and have great lives, yeah, that, and mine is terrible. Why do you deserve it? I think you don't. I think you all deserve to die. You all suck. You know. And some of them may be saying things like that to themselves, don't know. But it's very similar to the terrorists in that it is this selective kind of empathy, right, that um, they, they don't uh, want to do this. Uh, I'm sorry, that they – it doesn't bother them to do this. So those are – those are like the big things that I look at um, for kind of saying how things are similar or less similar. 
Many children and adults with moderate to severe disabilities, including but not limited to autism, struggle to learn functional skills, such as communication, daily living, and tolerating skills, skills that will matter in their adult lives. Essential for living is a comprehensive curriculum, assessment, skill tracking instrument, and practitioner handbook designed to help teachers, speech language pathologists, and behavior analysts teach functional skills and manage problem behavior. EFL includes 3,000 skills and focuses on the essential eight skills that are necessary for effective adult living. These include expressing your needs and wants, waiting, accepting no, transitioning, responding as a listener, tolerating commonly occurring situations, and avoiding hazardous ones. EFL also focuses on communication and language skills by helping those who are nonverbal find an effective alternative method of speaking that lasts a lifetime. The communication, language, and functional academic skills in EFL are also linked to the Common Core State Standards. EFL is more than just a list of skills. It's when and how to teach those skills and it's how to track small increments of learner progress often experienced by learners, especially those with severe handicaps. Join the ranks of school districts, private schools, ABA programs, and supported living communities that are effectively using Essential for Living to improve the lives of their students and residents. Visit our website to learn more about Essential for Living. Then give EFL two weeks and get a curriculum for a lifetime. So, so one of the things that is, you know, so if one of these events happens, we can look at it from the standpoint of, you know, how was this person motivated? Uh, were there, uh, you know, were the, were the things that would give anyone pause to commit this act? Were those things neutralized? Uh, did, did they yeah. cast a large group of people as an, as an out group? Uh, yeah. And had nothing, fourthly, yeah. I guess, had nothing going on in their lives. So those are the kind of key questions we can ask to to kind of see if this theoretical model fits, you know, it, it, with, with a lot of these events. Yeah, it is. And the thing is, the FBI has already done this. And a lot of the things that I say, the FBI has already said it. They just don't look at it specifically as a behavior analyst, but they are looking at behaviors. So they did look at things like uh, low empathy, problems with families, problems with peers, and they actually have profiles on all these kids. Uh, and the thing is, that doesn't appear on the news. So most people, they don't know have all this information. The FBI does. They have, they have all kinds of stuff like this on these guys. They do build profiles on them. So it's... um. Yeah, that's what what I'm looking for, these commonalities. The other thing that is kind of a um, – well, uh, do you want me to uh, – did you have another question? Do you want me to go into the flow charts or uh, answer something else? Let's uh, let's talk about a couple of concepts before we get to that. Okay. And we'll return to the uh, the flow chart. So you, you mentioned the term mental illness a minute ago. Um, let, let's take a minute to, to just talk about, you know, you, you kind of teased us with the, with the topic. So let's, let's dive sure. into that just a little bit more yeah. and talk about what is and isn't, uh, you know, a, okay. a, a sufficient condition to, as from, right. from a mental illness standpoint. Right. None, none of the different mental illnesses, um, are diagnosed like the, the traditional ones, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, um, th those kinds of things. Um, those are not characterized primarily by violence. Okay, that's not that's not the deciding factor, right? That's why people end up getting institutionalized. But simply believing you're the Queen of England or that aliens are invading your thoughts, that's not necessarily dangerous. So, which we'll get into what dangerousness is too. But um. M the most of the experts that I, I looked at uh, the articles written by various people, uh, there seems to be general agreement that those with mental illness are not the most violent people. They are not the most dangerous people. And that certainly could one of these people also have mental illness? Yes. But that doesn't mean that's a determining factor. Right. Because um, there's, there's the um, the there's, the person who shot. Uh, Gabby Giffords and uh, a handful of other folks in Arizona, and I think the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooter. I think 
I'm not mistaken, those two uh, had some pretty significant psychiatric issues. Right. Um, they did. But those are usually more more the exception. Um, so, you know, the um, the average individual who has mental illness, they're no more likely to kill than anybody else. Sure. And in fact, they're, they're usually less likely to kill. So uh, m- just as an example, most of the people, most of the murderers in prison are not mentally ill. OK, like 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 the vast majority of people in prison, they killed people, gang members who kill people. They're not mentally ill. Here's one of the issues. How often do they look for mental illness? So when there's a gang shooting and a gang member shoots eight other gang members, no one talks about mental illness. And the reason why is it's completely understandable. Everybody understands gang war. It's war. Everybody understands it. There's nothing mysterious. Could that guy have mental illness? Sure. Why not? Does anybody bring it up? No. Why do people bring up mental illness? Because they retreat to it, just like you retreat to the God of thunder when you hear thunder and you don't know why thunder happens. This is the same phenomenon. Okay, mm-hmm. people people retreat to mental illness as a garbage category of explaining human behavior that they cannot explain. So like the terrorist People used to say they're crazy. Now they understand them a little bit better. Now they may understand the terrorist is not crazy because it's kind of like war, right? It's like guerrilla warfare, terrorism, right? Um, it's understandable. It's in a way logical, not good, but logical. We understand it, right? The mass shootings are not logical. And because they're not logical and people don't understand it, now they start asking about mental illness. You could ask about mental illness for anybody who kills anybody. Right. But you don't hear that coming up. You only hear it come up when something happens that we can't understand why. Now we want to say mental illness. And certainly, as you know, if you ever cracked open the DSM five, I could give you and everybody, you know, a diagnosis. Everybody gets one. Everybody gets one. That's why they have personality disorders, which is mental illness light. OK, because if you do, if you don't have a full blown mental illness, we can give you a personality disorder. Anybody can get any one of these, because if you have any behavior that sticks out even a little bit, there's something that matches it in there. So, like, if you saw something heinous happen, most people do this kind of funky deductive reasoning. Um, he killed innocent children that never even did anything wrong to him. Uh, and so the, the major premise would be if you kill innocent children. You must be crazy. That's the major premise. He killed innocent children. Your deductive uh, conclusion, he is crazy. But the premise is flawed. You don't have to be crazy to do horrible things. Okay? The person who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima from that plane, pretty horrible thing. I don't think that person was crazy or mentally ill. No. Not at all. They were following orders. They were a military personnel following orders. They they pulled the button, pulled the trigger that killed hundreds of thousands of people. Is that person is that person mentally ill? No. Why? Sanctioned murder. Got what's it. What's the difference? You know, what's the difference really? So in, in one, by the way, you know they killed women and children. And you know that that pilot killed women and children that never did anything to him. Right. So in that regard, it's very much like the mass shootings in that regard. Right. Just in that narrow category. Yes. 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 But the point is, all behaviors, all things we do, they're all related. So that pilot had to have a certain lack of empathy to pull that trigger. Knowing what you're going to do, you're going to push a button and hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. Yeah. Right. So you have to have a certain amount of if you're in the law enforcement, you're a surgeon. You're an emergency worker. You have to have selective empathy. You must because you'll be completely dysfunctional if you don't. If your empathy is super high, this is another issue about empathy. If your empathy is super high all the time, depending on the job you do, it will be debilitating. Right? Could you imagine a surgeon that sees blood and a little kid and reminds him of his kid? And the surgeon says or she says, I I can't do this. I'm too freaked out. They look like my child. Right? That would be you'd have too much empathy. You can't be effective. You'd be too afraid to make a mistake, right? Does that make sense? Oh, totally. So without this selective empathy, the difficult things that people have to do, how about restraining someone with disabilities, right? If I didn't have selective empathy, and I've seen this, I've seen staff that are 
they're almost in tears about holding somebody because their empathy is so high, which is generally not a bad thing. Their empathy is so high they can't function. Right. I have to shut it off for a second, be like a robot, not angry, but not also overly empathetic because if I'm too empathetic, I'm not going to be able to do it properly. Right. I have to right. be able to control myself and then go be empathetic when it's over. I see. So, right. yeah. That's so in many contexts, having selective empathy is not a bad thing and in some place, in some we cases, all, adaptive. We, we all do it. We all do it and we all have to do it. It's when it becomes too selective or, or too broad, you lose it too broadly. So like you lose empathy for an entire group of people. You lose empathy for an entire country, you know, uh, th- that kind of thing. But, yeah, we all have selective. You have to. But when it gets really, really imbalanced, then you start to see all kinds of problems. Um, so, oh, by the way, the, the oh, other factor, ahead. the other factor nobody ever brings up, uh, white males, white males. This is a white male problem, hands down. There's an occasional woman who does stuff like this. There's been the occasional black person. This is a white, angry, white male problem. The, the school, the mass shootings. OK, it doesn't take long to look at it. Nobody wants to say that on CNN, but that's what it is. Yeah, it, that's who it's happening with. That's a, so who would be at risk? Young, angry, white men. OK, that, that's who we as far as like prevention. OK, that would be your demographic, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so that's what all people had in common was a penis, which is not explicit. That's just biological. So I can, I can <laughs> say right. that this will not be tagged uh, explicit. Yeah, this will not be tagged explicit. This is medical. Uh, but that's one thing they all had in common that nobody wants to talk about. Um, which, hey, man, that's an issue. Males, again, not to be sexist, but just generally, males tend to be more aggressive of the two genders. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and that's, 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 that's no not, question. that's not controversial. You know, right. there's, there's so, an abundance of literature that would, that would suggest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They are. So that would be like one of the things is, is that's part of the problem. And that's one of the characteristics is that they are male. And in our country, at least, they are usually white. I see. Um, okay, you know. Uh, so uh, yeah. So those are those are some similarities I think with uh, terrorism and that. Uh, incidentally, all the types of murder they all have some of these. So just as a quick example, but here's the differences. Like the hitman. Like if you think of any hitman movie you saw, right? The hitman also has selective empathy, but not for an entire population. It's just the person that he's supposed to kill. The mark. The mark. Right. That is, he doesn't want to kill innocents. He may even have his own family. He may love children and dogs. OK, but this is just what he does. As another example, the military, the military sniper. He's like he's like a socially sanctioned hitman. OK, the military sniper is a socially sanctioned hitman. OK, they they have their mark. They have empathy for their peers. They have empathy for the people of the country they're trying to free. They have zero empathy for the person they're about to put a bullet in their head. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's from that point of view. At the, now, at the, well, let me, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I I'm, a, I'm acquaintance with uh, some folks who've done that uh, as, as their job in the military and, uh, Without getting into too much detail, yeah, I would say that uh, the one person in particular that I'm thinking of was, uh, um, you meet him on the street and he's like the, the most gentlest, sweetest guy you'd ever know. And you would never guess in a million years that he was a, he was a sniper. Um, but that empathy does, you know, at least just speaking for this, you know, kind of N of one, if you will, this anecdote, yeah. uh, the, the empathy does come back. I mean, he's, sure. he's troubled by, you know, the, the, that, that work to some extent, and, not, not in a debilitating and, sense, right. but it's not, no, no. It, it's, it's not free of consequences, if yes. you will. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not that necessarily every person who is a sniper has zero empathy. They certainly shut it off when they pull the trigger. Yes. Yes. That, but, 100%. Uh, but, but they could have various levels of it. Now, by the way, there there could be two hitmen in the military. One of them is your buddy. He regrets what he did. He feels bad about what he did. He even knows that person he's killing maybe had a family, but he knows that this is what needs to be done. But he still feels bad about it. There's another person in the military, I guarantee you, he is extremely happy about what he did. He's bragging to his buddies, and he can't wait till the next one. And there is there are people in the military like that, I see. without a doubt. OK, without a doubt. Why? Because there's people like that in the general population. There's pe- bullies, people who like to beat people up, 
people who like to watch people get killed. There's that is a subsection of the population. Now, that's not everybody in the military, but, you know, there's some people in the military like that because there's some people like that in the general population. So it would only stand to reason. Um, but the point is, is that it could be higher or lower for any one person. Right. And if they shut it off, I mean, if they have like zero empathy, then they um, as an example, it would affect them later. Like people that have PTSD, if you have very, very high empathy for other humans, I would expect you'd be much more likely to have PTSD because you feel bad about what you did. Right. Yeah. If you have zero empathy. Right. I don't think the psychopath feels that bad about what they did. And that's what gives them that label, by the way. You know, do you feel bad about it? No. Nah. Everybody's got to die. It was his time. Okay. You don't feel bad about it? Nah. <laughs> okay. You're going to get that from some people, right? So it's, it's, it, it could be very, very different for a lot of, uh, individuals. Honestly, I think probably one of the biggest ones. And uh, here's the other thing that I did, Matt. And by the way, this is important for all the behavior analysts out there. What I was did to f- try to figure out for this to make sense to me is I did what is called a discrepancy analysis. And I do that with behavior problems as well. This is not really a behavioral term. I think maybe a couple of other people used it. Um, Ennio Sapani, I think, referred to it. And I found one other just remote reference that somebody used. But basically what a discrepancy analysis is, you look at your problem, your behavior problem, and you say, what – why does this same thing not happen with this group of people? So with this group of people, they become mass shooters. How come everybody doesn't become mass shooters? What's the difference? So as an example, like um, these guys, some of the motivators for some of the shooters being excluded from groups, being made fun of, being rejected by a love interest, right? Um, I've had these happen to me. You've probably had these happen to you. How come you and I didn't go get a gun and shoot people? Well, that's a very good question. How about all the gun owners in America? How come they don't when they get they all get pissed off? I get pissed off. You get pissed off. Your buddy gets pissed off. How come we all don't go out and kill people? We have the guns. We get mad just like everybody else. We had people reject us. We have people screw us over in our lives and we have anger. Right. How come we all don't do it? Well, because the the other boxes aren't checked. Right. Right. On that list. Yes. And so one reason is, let me give you an example. I'll use the president for an example. Most people would say that he is highly unempathetic. Okay. (laughs) Okay. That's what most people probably say. Kind of, it's kind of an easy one. All right. So he's got as much as much as I try not to get into politics on this show. I would, I would say that's non contra That's a non controversial. That's a non controversy. (laughs) I'm just using it as an example. Uh, this is not really politics. This is just about personality. So, so yeah. So let's say, okay, low empathy. All right. Here's another one. Is 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 the president motivated to get back at some people? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Very much. He has lots of motivation and lots of people that he doesn't like. OK, now, does the president have a lot to lose if he were to put a contract out on someone and they found out about it? Yes, he has everything to lose. OK, that's probably <laughs> That's probably one of the only things keeping him in check. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but uh, you know. So uh, this is kind of funny. You know, John Oliver last last week t- today, uh, the, last week tonight uh, on yeah, HBO. Yeah, I'm familiar with. He's I'm a not, British I don't guy. Tune in. Yeah, uh, I, I know of it. I'm not a. He's I, a British yeah, guy. Yeah. He's really funny, and he's going. He's talking about murder and like the laws about murder. And he goes, you know, I think one thing is one of the things that keeps people from murdering. Is the law against murder? Okay. Now, he's right and he's wrong. And because for any law like that, like uh, laws against murder, there's three segments of the population. And this is related to our talk. There's three groups in the population. One, two, three. Okay. One group of people, even without the laws of murder, would not run out and start murdering people. So like me, if they pass a law tomorrow that says, hey, guys, murder is okay. It's not going to be Merrill Winston's version of The Purge. Okay, right. that's, it's not. That's, that's it's the not first like, movie oh. I thought of. Actually, right. It's not going to be like, oh man, that guy that Hell like pissed yeah. me off in 1992. <laughs> I'm going to find him. No, I'm not doing that. Okay, I'm not doing that. So now there's another segment of the population. They are they're right on the fence. They're kind of murdery, but the only thing keeping them from doing it is that damn law against murder. And then there's a third group of people, Matt. 
those people are already busy murdering. OK, and the laws against murder will not stop them. It simply makes them very careful, like the hitman. OK, so the laws of murder or anything else, those only apply to people who would think of maybe doing it, <laughs> generally speaking. And that's that's a very small segment of the population. The, the, the segment of the population that actually does murder that's an even smaller segment of the population. And this is something that most people don't really think about when they talk about banning this or banning that or making that illegal. Yeah, that'll work well on people who generally wouldn't do it anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, people people <laughs> right on the right on the border. So right? so this is probably a good segue into the issue of guns that we brought up uh, earlier. Sure. Uh one of and I've got a Ton of listener questions yeah, here. Yeah, I've got I've got them here too. And uh, so one of them, uh, uh, Diane uh, from Australia, wrote in, and she said, from yes. an outsider's perspective, uh, the be- this behavior of carrying guns and having them freely available does not make sense whatsoever. Uh, she feels unsafe in the United States, uh, etc. I'm going to paraphrasing here, Diane. Sorry, but no, you know, basically, uh, you know yeah. what. Uh, uh, she, she's concerned about people owning and having guns, and um, you know the perhaps higher likelihood of yeah. danger associated yeah. uh, with that. There, there is, let me be as clear as I can about this. There is no question that the mass shootings we see is partly a reflection. Not, it is not entirely responsible for it. But the number of mass shootings we see is clearly related to the sheer number of guns we have in this country. There's no question about it. They have the same problems in other countries that they have here. And that's what Joe Wyatt was talking about um, when he did a presentation on it. And um, they have the same things we have here. They have violent video games. They have violent movies. In fact, there are violent movies that we export. OK, they have um, everybody loves our violent movies with guns in them, including the people who hate guns. They still go watch those movies. Um, <laughs> that's a great that, point. No, it's, it, well, it is a great point. And one of the one of the reasons is what I want to explain to Diane and what I do as part of my presentation. This is what people in other countries don't understand about the United States. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's we're stuck with it, guys. We're stuck with it. Um, one thing about the United States, guns are part of our history more so than any other country. Hands down. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our media. It's part of our culture. Cowboys, Indians, Westerns, Private Eye, police shows, okay, vengeance movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rambo, those all come from a gun. Tarantino. Tarantino. They all, all the most loved, the Matrix. How many bullet casings were in that scene when they stormed the building, okay? Uh, Just an insane number. John Wick. I think they actually have on on John Wick 2. There's actually a thing called like the um, headshot count or murder count. Uh, and don't like spoil special- it for me. I haven't seen that one yet. Well, no, it's in the special features. So after the movie's over, you do special features. And it, in five minutes, it shows you like 173 people being shot. Jeez, uh, so, you know, the thing is that people talk out of both sides in their mouth. They say, oh, guns are awful. Guns are bad. OK, well. Stop watching violent movies. Stop watching all these things because your dollars for those movies, they produce those movies because people like those movies and they sell. It's all about money. So what people unwittingly do is when you buy a movie to Rambo or something where somebody's getting shot up, you're kind of telling the movie industry we like gun violence. You kind of are. Okay? I mean, I'm doing it too. I love those movies. Oh, right? yeah. But yeah. Let's, it, all, it, let's all be – and it's, not just, and it's not just it's not just Rambo and Schwarzenegger. It's you know, let you know Martin Scorsese, everything, you know, uh, uh, everything, you know, all, classics, all, you know, yeah, yeah, classic westerns, uh, Clint Eastwood. That's all about shooting holes in people. Okay, <laughs> that's all about shooting holes in people, and it's glorified and it's made wonderful, and you're a hero because you killed bad people. But you know, the thing that folks from other countries don't understand is this is all part of our culture. They, they don't understand this. Now, no, they're not needed. I, and I agree. Yeah, I feel completely safe without that. my gun. I don't give a crap. It doesn't – I don't have that for that. Um, so – but here's the problem. It is part of our culture. You know, I don't know about Diane and how things were in Australia when she was little. I don't remember when she moved there. And, and I know Dan. Uh, but um, that uh, when I was a kid, we all had cap guns, man, and we were shooting at each other left and right. Absolutely. Okay? 
everything with guns. Everything was guns. My and the, BB and the, gun. And, and the toy guns looked like real guns back in they the day. They looked like real guns, yes. They looked like real guns. They, they, didn't, have just, the, they didn't have the orange cap on them or whatever. Yeah, that they right. Do. That, that, was bef- that was in the day when cops never even unsnapped their service revolver, okay? It really wasn't a problem. It's like nobody got shot by a cop back then. But anyway, everything was everything was guns. Cap guns, toy guns, squirt guns, all guns. And we were all shooting each other all the time, and it was awesome. It was okay? totally awesome, but yeah. It was totally awesome. But that's part – here's the thing. That's part of the history. There's also like 300 million guns in the population, basically one for every human okay, in, in the United States. So the thing is that even if tomorrow they said, that's it, you, we had a good run, there will be no more guns sold, you still got 300 million guns in the population. I alone have 20 or 30. Okay, and by the way, I think they said most of the guns are owned by a small percentage of the population. They're people getting ready for the zombie apocalypse. So uh, but but anyway, there's still those guns out there. And this is part of the problem. Um, And they're still going to be sold. And here's the other problem that we're mired in. Everything comes back to money. Guns are money. Guns are money. They represent money. Okay, they can be used to barter with. They are expensive relatively. Okay, they can be very expensive and the manufacturers make a lot of money from them. Then there's the ammo companies and this all gets kind of tied in. And and, and in fact, uh, so it's it's a thing that we're so mired in. And one of the reasons that I put this talk together is it's not. Let me be really clear for the listeners. I'm not against tighter gun control. Make if I had a button on my desk that I could push and magically the sale of all high capacity, easy to fire rifles. It was just banned instantly. I'd do it in a second. I'd do it in a second. All high capacity magazines. I'd do it in a second. I have no problem with that. It doesn't matter to me. I find get rid of all of them. It's first of all, I don't think it's going to happen. Second of all, even if it did, here's what you get. You get a lower body count. Right. Which is significant. And it's horrible to even talk about words like body count. But let's be realistic. Um, you know, one of the things that the guns do that uh, the role and back to Diane's question. I'm sorry, Diane. We've got guns probably forever. OK, maybe we could get less of them if we had a buyback program like they did in Australia and they spent millions buying back guns. I think I don't know how much they spent, but I think they got a million guns off the street, which is a good start. But remember, we have over 300 million guns. Right. This is it's a it's a different problem, but certainly it should be attacked by several angles. But I'm for gun control and much tighter. I personally, I think people should be licensed, but that's just me. Do I think it's going to happen? Nope. What do I think our best bet is? I think our best bet is prevention, starting when children are very very young, and I think that is probably our very best bet uh, as far as minimizing these things. Um, you know, uh, as far as saving the people that are already out there, it's a little bit tougher. But this is the problem is this is something that will not go away tomorrow, just like terrorism. In fact, it will never go away. The other thing is, even if there's no guns, people get creative. The problem still exists. And the problem is one of I get angry. I don't care about people and I want people to die. And I pe- uh, remember um, Oklahoma City bombing done with uh, fertilizer, diesel, diesel fuel. Yeah, Boston Marathon, uh, pressure cooker, uh, 9-11, airplanes. So uh, – and then people – there have been numerous incidents in France and other countries where people just drive a truck down the middle of the street. And there was young one, one young man who uh, uh, actually – he didn't get to do it. He got caught. But he was going to drive in his car and just start mowing people down at random. So you know, people need to understand this, that yes, guns are a huge problem. And yes, the way I talk about it, Matt, is that – uh, what is the role of, of firearms if that comes up? Here's the role. It, ta- it makes it makes killing much easier, much more efficient, and depersonalizes it. It also um, do you, this would be a good place to talk about dangerousness. Do you yeah, want to bring yeah, that up? That was literally next okay. on my list. So I was thinking about this the other night, and I know there's dictionary definitions of what dangerous is, but let me give you how I'm talking about dangerousness in this context. Um, There are people who – let's talk about two parts of dangerousness. One is your potential for harm, the potential for harm that you can do. Two, the probability that you will do this. So as an example, a five-year-old has very low potential for harm. There's only so much they can do to you, 
Okay, the probability of them trying to harm you if they're like have behavior problems and they're nonverbal, maybe they have autism or related disability, the probability of them trying to harm you might be extremely high. They might do it 80 times a day. Right. But I would not term them dangerous. Why? Their potential for damage is quite low. Do you understand? Sure. So they could pinch you. They could scratch you. Maybe get a little bite. You're not going to die. That you're not going to die. By the way, most behavior analysts out there with most clients you're ever going to work with, most of you are not going to be uh, have your life threatened by by a client in real time. Most of you are not going to be in a life threatening situation to yourself with your clients. Um, you know, there'd be exceptions, but in most cases, that's not going to happen. Those would be people working in forensics, prison populations, populations where people are actually more dangerous. So let's give another example. Let's give an example of somebody that is has a very high potential for damage, right? Your friend who is the sniper, who is military trained, right? He has a very, he's military trained. He has an extremely high potential for damage, right? Yeah. He's a trained killer. Okay, let's be Literally. clear. But he has high empathy. There is low probability he will use these skills for a not nice reason. Right. There is a low probability he's going to use these skills because somebody cut him off. Now, let's take somebody who has who maybe is what you'd call a criminal, extremely uh, uh, high potential for damage. That is, is good with firearms, good with knives, good with his hands, can improvise use of weapons, has hurt people badly before, maybe even killed people before, is willing to kill people. So they have a very high potential for damage and they're a hothead, high probability. OK, so this person, you cut them off in your car, they might shoot you. And that exists in Miami. That's why if somebody cuts you off, you don't give them the finger. You look the other way. Don't make eye contact. OK, nope, definitely don't make eye contact. No, because it might be that dude. And that dude is dangerous. What do, what do I mean by dangerous? High potential for damage, high probability of trying to do it. Right. So now here's the thing about guns. Do you remember, just as a, that's just a total no, aside. Do you remember like in the 80s in L.A.? There was a spate of like hot people shooting at you other in the high on the highways. Uh I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, it just made me think about that. Um, so anyway. So, but anyway, that that's what I think about uh, as far as dangerousness goes. Now, here's the thing about handguns. <sighs> handguns instantly increase your potential for damage. This is why they're all kinds of guns. This is why they're so damn dangerous. So you, you can take someone who is otherwise not dangerous because their potential for inflicting damage is low. They're weak. They're not a skilled martial artist. They don't know how to use knives. They can stab at you, but they're not a knife wielding fighter. Okay. They don't know how to do any of this. If you give them a gun, now they have a high potential for damage. So if you have somebody that has a high probability for aggression, but low potential for damage, and they suddenly have access to a gun. Now you've jacked up their potential for damage. Now they're dangerous, right? Without mm-hmm. the gun, you can whoop their butts, right? Your friend in the military, without a gun, he still he still has a high – not dangerous because he probably wouldn't do it. But your buddy without the gun, he still has a high potential for damage. Navy SEAL, high potential for damage. My sensei, uh, Robert Mason, he's a seventh degree uh, in Japanese karate. He's about 60 now. He could probably take out a room full of people in 15 seconds if he wanted to. Okay, but he's not dangerous either. And the reason why is he has a low probability for using his karate against people. All right. He would walk. He would be the first worst first person to run away from a fight because he doesn't want to end up killing somebody and being liable for it. Right. So he actually is very non-dangerous, but his potential, his like your buddy, his potential for damage is staggering. Off the charts, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it is. Like I, I wouldn't even – I wouldn't stand – I've done karate for a long time. I wouldn't stand a chance against him. <laughs> that would be it. Um, but um, does that does that make sense for like, yeah, the concept yeah, no, no, of dangerousness? Yeah, I think that's a pretty neat um, way of looking at it. That, that's how I look at it. And, and so the thing is that's what guns allow, right? Because if there's only samurai swords available – Everybody has samurai swords. Now when you go up against someone, you may not fare so well if you don't have skills. Guns require no skill. They require um, – they also allow you to disengage from people. So 
it allows you to maintain this low empathy because you shoot at people from a distance, right? If And this is kind of gruesome, I apologize, but if you stab somebody, that's kind of up close and personal. That takes a whole other level of willingness to harm people and see the impact of what you're doing yeah. right up next to you. That uh, uh, that just strikes me, having never shot or stabbed anyone, that just strikes me as much more personal and more difficult to do. Um, and so... You know, firearms do a lot of things. They lower the response cost. They lower the response effort. They allow you to maintain low empathy. Um, They allow a higher rate of kill. And so the thing is that whatever, you know, the gun advocates are against, you can't argue this. If you have a weapon that only holds six bullets, you have to stop and change. That gives somebody an opportunity to, to get you. OK, if you have, if you have a firearm that has a clip that holds 100 rounds, the amount of damage you can do is staggering and they should be illegal, period. The end. There's no reason to need those. OK, just like no one needs a howitzer. OK, right. or, or, you know, a grenade launcher. All right. Nobody needs that either. These are military weapons designed for high kill rate. So that is true. Now, the thing is, though, I don't want people to be disillusioned if you banned, let's say successfully, magically. We magically got rid of all AR-15s or any rifle that could hold a high. By the way, AR-15 doesn't matter. It could be any rifle that's capable of accommodating a large clip. Yep. Okay, They tend to have a higher kill rate. They're easier to control. And the two two three round is like firing a BB gun. Okay, There's almost no recoil. So first of all, no one should have those. But if you ban those tomorrow and all clips that were higher than, say, seven rounds – There's still going to be school shootings. People are very creative. They'll bring multiple guns, multiple clips. They'll bring a backpack full of clips. They'll practice unloading and getting the clip back in quickly, which you can do very fast if you practice it. Okay, and there's plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to port the well on your on your on your gun and how to get a magazine that slips in quickly. And it shows you how to practice changing it. Anybody can learn how to do that skill. My point is. Ban them all tomorrow. Let's say they're all magically gone tomorrow. You still got a problem. There's going to be handguns. There's going to be revolvers. There's going to be all these other things. As long as there's semi-automatic pistols, for example, you can change a clip out in those in a couple seconds, right? Drop, clip, hit the slide, you're back in business. It does not take long, right? So unless people are going to be given muskets, (laughs) <laughs> okay, right. where you have to do the ramrod, you know, after each shot. Muzzle loaders, unless yeah. Yeah, unless you're doing muzzle loaders, um, I'm sorry, there's still going to be huge potential for damage. Would you lower the kill rate? Probably, but you won't lower the incidence of shooting. So this is what I try to point out to people. Let's say that there's no, let's say there's no semi-automatic handguns. Let's say all there are is old wheel guns, like in the old West revolvers. Yeah. Where you have to like cock the hammer before you pull it. Yeah. Yeah. They're not even double action. It's single action. You got to pull the hammer back or fan it with your hand like that. Like in the old movies, let's say there's only that you think there's going to be no more shooting simply because there's no semi autos. Mm Mm-mm. People will use revolvers. doesn't matter. You use multiple revolvers. No big deal, right? People get very creative. And so the fundamental problem is this, um, which I haven't even addressed yet. Um, it, it's, it's multiple things, but here's an additional thing that's a problem. A subculture of young men for whom this is a thing, like they follow it. They want to know where the next shooter is. They keep up on all this. They probably have their own message board about shootings. Every, you know, there's so many subcultures on the internet. It's going to be staggering, but I am certain there is a mass shooting subculture. And in that subculture, there are people reinforcing each other's verbal behavior back and forth, learning new things. Why wouldn't there be? Think about it. The internet, Matt, is a very big place. The Internet is a very big place. And one thing I've learned is everything is a thing. Everything is a thing. So like any sexual thing, it's already a thing. OK, if you if you type in stepping on scrambled eggs with naked feet dot com, it's probably a website. All right. Everything is a thing. So given given that the Internet is so wide and there's so many kinds of information on it and you can find out how to make bombs on it. I find it hard to believe there isn't a number of subgroups specifically about school shootings and a subculture in which this is a cool thing. And if that's the case, if it is the case, then you have another problem of a subculture where we feed off each other. Okay. We motivate each other. 
And this is a this already happens. So, I mean, there's people. Yeah. So, so this gets to a question. I'm going to try to weave in some some audience yeah, questions sure. here because sure. I, uh, we're we're touching on a lot of this stuff, and I don't want to be redundant later. But Beth no, asks, no. you know, um, about copycats. Uh, yeah, and, and um, not just in the in the context in which you're describing here with these kind of uh, community groups uh, reinforcing their own verbal behavior, but also uh, the media coverage that comes along with this. And, and as uh, you and I were kind of corresponding yesterday through email, you know, what I was kind of talking about, you know, oftentimes this posthumous attention, uh, you know, yep. uh, re- as a reinforcer. <laughs> well, technically not. Uh, right, right. Yeah, of course. But, yeah, that has yeah, all know, sorts of I problems know. with it conceptually. No, but, uh, the- no, but here's here's how I figure that one in. And it is extremely important. Um, the news outlets are undeniably making this problem worse. I actually was so upset about it. I actually wrote a uh, a, a letter, well, electronic letter to CNN saying, guys, you need to be more responsible in what you're doing. And if you'd like to talk about it and have me explain what CNN is unwittingly doing and everybody else, I go, but CNN's the leader in news. At least that's what James Earl Jones always tells me. So I thought maybe they would want to step up to the plate. And what I'm proposing is not uh, censorship per se, but responsible reporting. And one of the things they do, which they need to stop doing effective immediately, is they need to stop putting the picture of the shooter in the name of the shooter. No one needs to know this. No one needs to know this. Just like on a case where the person is a juvenile and they're not allowed to release the name or tell anything about the case or the police are still working on it. So the police puts a moratorium on the releasing of the information. We can pass laws that are just like that and like, if you want to release this information, you have to put it on your website and you have to bury it two links deep. You know, so people have to go out of their way to find it. But for them to give a second of airtime to a picture of the person who did the shooting, flash his name, that is absolutely going to be a motivator to somebody. You know, there's no way, there's no way it couldn't. Right. It's going to, it's going to affect somebody, right? So the thing is, the, the general population, I don't need to see on television what the name is and what the picture is. As a person who's interested in this, I would like to know some facts about it, but I can know the facts about the case without knowing the name of the person. Seeing his face in no way helps me analyze the situation. So if they want America to understand what happened, fine. Describe what happened. Don't say who did it and don't show their face. There's no need for that and it would only make things worse. So I think that that is that's not necessarily the motivator it may be a contributing factor but i think that the copycat things and the new the media that explains why people pick the form they do cuz they got the idea from somebody else but it doesn't explain why they got motivated enough to kill so it's not as though a well adjusted young man who has high empathy and a really good life suddenly sees this story on the news and goes damn That looks kind of fun. Hey, Joey, my dad has a gun. What do you say we go shoot up to school? Okay, this so does not happen. Sure. This does not happen. So, uh, you know, it's not as though seeing the gun or having access to the gun suddenly puts that thought in your mind. Hey, it'd be cool to kill a bunch of people. That's not how that happens. So, you know, that's kind of another one of the the issues that go along with it, I think. But, yes, the, uh, the, the media... Uh, plays a horrendous role in this that they don't even they either are explicitly understand they do or it's implicit but it's not good i see um so i have a husband and wife team alina and matt um yeah i saw that they wrote a bunch of really great questions one of the questions i'm uh interested really interested in getting your take on is um what are some i guess precursor behaviors if you will uh, you know, are there, are there other behaviors that, that are indicative of potential school shooting that, you know, prior to someone engaging in that act, you know, and I, I, before you answer, I'll just add a little bit of context here too. My wife is a high school English teacher and I think anyone who's taught, uh, in public school every once in a while will say, Oh, this kiddo, it won't surprise me, you know, fill in the blank. And, uh, you know, so, um, so based on your analysis of these, Perpetrators and events, et cetera. Uh, are there any um, any any uh, I guess uh, uh, responses yeah. that are problematic that they'll engage in prior to, or perhaps that are predictive of a school shooting? 
Um, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I know the FBI does profiles on people, and I think that um, I think that some of the things are that uh, at least for some of them, what they found is most of them had things about that they either wrote, like writing about it, talking about it, and uh, as far as precursors, for most of them, it's talking about it. I think at least in a couple cases, some school shootings were stopped because um, uh, one kid talked about he told his friend, don't come to school tomorrow. And his friend, he said, why? He said something really bad's going to happen. And his friend went and told people and they stopped it. You know, so uh, some of them, I think, will talk about it. But um, the other ones would be preoccupations with firearms, things blowing up, terrorism, people dying, people who are fascinated, spend a lot of time on the web with that. Um, they did say, and by the way, I don't think this causes it. I think it's simply a characteristic of people that already like this. They said that they tend to seek out and play more violent video games and stuff like that. Right now, that said, my kids love violent video games. They're grown up now. They are the kindest, gentlest people ever. I love violent video games. I'm the last person that's going to get in a fight. They don't make you violent. But if you are violent and you have low empathy and you love seeing people killed, you will tend to want to play these games. That's where the confusion, I believe, lies. I don't believe they're causative. I believe they're correlational. More than likely, the kids that did all these killings, they like those games. Because in those games, you get to kill civilians. Grand Theft Auto. You want to run somebody over? Go run somebody over. Okay? Got it. Uh, so... You know, uh, I, I think the other thing is that because um, I, I do it at the end of my talk. But one of the things as far as prevention, honestly, I'm looking for the kid with I'd be looking for the kid with nothing to lose, the kid with nothing to lose. It's like it's every revenge movie, the trailer you've ever heard for every revenge movie. They all sound the same. They've killed his wife. They killed his family. They shot his dog. And he has nothing to live for. And a man with nothing to live for is a dangerous man. It's it's every vengeance movie you ever saw, right? And they all say the same thing. He has nothing to live for. He has nothing to fear. That means you don't fear incarceration. You don't fear death. You don't fear losing money. You don't fear what people think, right? If you have nothing to live for any, anymore, some people, that is what makes them desperate and dangerous, right? That last thing. And so, you know, the, the kid who is the captain of the football team and is loved by everyone and who, you know, sings in the church choir and who volunteers to feed the homeless, this kid's not being a mass shooter, okay? He's not going to be a mass shooter, he has all kinds of reinforcers, all kinds of things he loves. Now, could it happen? Could something weird happen and him snap and something we don't know about? Probably. But if you look at the profile of all the people that do these things, these are not happy people. These are not happy people. They're not happy people. They don't have joy. They don't have things they love. They don't cop awesome reinforcers from all kinds of things they do. They don't have wonderful, beneficial control over others. That is, people don't love them and they have influence over them. And they get to control people in nice ways. These are people that are controlled by others all day long, in their own minds, have a shitty life, low empathy, probably don't have a lot of people they love, right? Right. I mm -hmm. mean, for God's sakes, if you even had a dog you loved, would you do these things? You know, seriously? Uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question, but just kind of thinking out loud, I, I tend to think these guys wouldn't have had a dog they loved, you know, or maybe even anybody. Right? Yeah, so some you sort know? of serious disconnection uh, yes. and more globally. So yeah. I, have, I have a bunch of questions here just on schools in general. And, sure. and uh, so Elizabeth writes in. Um, What's your stance on the effectiveness of SROs? And for those who don't work in schools, that means school resource officer. Um, do you think they're a deterrent? What do you? What's your, what are your thoughts on SROs? Here, uh, here's here's my thought. Um, the uh, most of the schools, I think, now have them. Um, I don't. Well, first of all, I don't think anybody has any data on whether or not they are a um, deterrent. But here would be the, the thought. If the primary uh, – there, there's a couple things going on with school shooters. Suicide for most of them 
most of them are not planning on escaping. Okay, these are not hitmen who are going to do something and then slip out of the country with a passport. None of these guys. Okay, these are people that either expect to die or maybe are deciding to die. I think in some cases it might be like just another form of glory. It's it's a form of glorified suicide. So it is suicide primarily like for some of them. I don't know. But for some of them, it may be I'm going to kill myself, but I'm taking a bunch of you out with me. It's it's, and people have said stuff like that. Um, So if it is um, if it's one of those, I don't think the SRO makes a difference. Because they, they they plan on getting killed. They are pretty sure they can kill somebody, a few people, before they do get killed. I think okay. that's probably what most of them think. And here's my best guess. My best guess is it wouldn't do anything. That is, you'd be better off with the tactics of teaching children to hide and door stops that prevent the door from being opened to the classroom. Like really clever things people thought of. I think those would work much better in a school-wide alarm system and lockdown than an SRO per se. That is, if you, I, I would be, I would put my money on taking the targets away from the school shooter most effectively. Because uh, you know what? I don't think that fear of being shot by an SRO, sorry, man, these guys have already just decided they're going to die. I think for a lot of them, they just might be concerned, maybe I won't be able to kill as many. Yeah, that's Honestly. perhaps more of the thought that the, the SRO would respond once the shooting was underway. And yep. uh, they, yep. might be able to limit the, they might be able to limit the damage, but oftentimes, you know, I would imagine there would be yeah. some number and of fatalities is, before that. Hey, man, I'm all for limiting damage. But again, all these things would limit damage. And, you know, should we do things, you know, that reasonably we can afford to do so, because some of them involve money, we should do everything we can to limit damage, everything. But there's still going to be damage and there's still going to be episodes until we get, you know, probably always. But the question is, can we get to the point where we start understanding this so well that we take really great preventive measures and constantly give assessments to kids in schools for things like, and I talk about it at the end of my presentation, um, like quality of life measures, like, like, you know, what would be, I think that honestly, Matt, the biggest hedge against these things is what do you have to lose? Do you have anything to lose? Do you see yourself as having um, anything to lose? What is your life worth living? And so the thing is, I think that if you have people, this is one of the most important variables. If your life is worth living, you're probably not going to be a mass shooter. You might kill somebody, but you're going to kill somebody and run away. You're going to uh, you're going to uh, you're going to kill somebody and try to get away with it. Right. And you're not going to do a mass shooting either. Right. So you go into some other class of violent behavior. So you would go into others. You go into some other class of murder, just like, you know, uh, the jealous lover. You know, that's 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 a different kind of a thing. So if they're you know, that's why I don't like people lumping in and calling it gun violence, because mass shooting is a world away from jealous lover shooting. Okay, it's it's a whole different Gangland shooting, it's a whole different ball of wax. It has some similarities, but it, it is, yeah, it is a different thing. And I find that if people had lives that were like super important to them, right, and people that were super important to them and things that they uh, – uh, one of the things I call it is just being effective, like in, in controlling your world. Like I can make stuff happen. Uh, I can make people laugh or I can make people smile or I can make people help me or whatever. But I can control people in beneficial ways, which is why the reason a lot of people get into politics. Your words can have effects on millions, right? So that's why a lot of people do that. But we would call that beneficial control. A lot of these individuals, they have no beneficial control. So what do you do? You take it any way you can. And a gun, that gives you a a bunch of control. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I edited. Um, it gives you a bunch of control. So, so I, yeah. are, are you familiar with uh, acceptance and commitment therapy? Um, only a, a little bit. I know it comes out of relational frame theory, um, but I, I know it has something to do with you know, accepting things you can't change, which just speaks to desensitization and function of the stimulus control. And then the commitment is like kind of like new rule following kind of thing or something like that. But that's about all I got. Yeah. Well, one of the aspects of it is uh, there, there are, uh, you know, half a dozen skills that make up, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 
contribute to, uh, you know, what's referred to as psychological flexibility. And I don't want to get on a huge tangent about ACT, but part of the, there are a bunch of curricula out there that um, are <clears throat> targeted to the school setting. Mm -hmm. One in particular part of that is, uh, you know, developing what's called values. You know, what are the big picture items in your life that you uh, uh, find important, you know, and these aren't necessarily okay. goals yes. per se. These aren't things you can have and hold in your hands, but they're things like, you know, being a good, uh, being a good friend, living a, a healthy lifestyle. And the committed action steps are the things are the, are the more targeted things that lead you in a, the behaviors in a, that lead to those things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so I, I have a couple of questions here from uh, sure. Celia and Teresa, like asking about like, what are the roles of, of, of things like PBIS and others? And I think, you know, n not, not to answer the question for you, but I think anything that would develop that sense of purpose more broadly, you know, so if, uh, you know, and, and, and develop things that someone can lose, but you know, you know, yeah. so you, you, you create the antithesis of I, the, the man with nothing to lose as you so yeah, yeah, yeah. humorously, uh, you know, uh, yeah, what you, want is, you want the man, you want the man with everything to lose. And I, and I think that that can fit in with any of these. I think one of them though, no matter what system they're using, PBIS or anything, one of the things I'd be looking for in a kid is what do you love? First of all, forget even before values or anything else, what do you love? What do, what do you love? And what's, what are your relationships like? You know, um, do you know how to be kind? Like just skills, right? Do you know how to pet a puppy? You know how to be nice to a puppy? Do you know how to help somebody, right? Even at very, very, very young ages, right? Um, and also for older kids, like as far as assessments go, uh, things that get at quality of life. Like, uh, you know, like the, the thing, what is it? The um, privilege walk. You know about the privilege walk? No. That's where... Uh, there's a bunch of people in a line and you take one step oh, forward. Oh, yeah, if yeah, you yeah, had yeah. this this thing, great thing in your life, like if you got to go to college, take a step forward. Yes. If one of your parents got shot, take a step back. And like there are people at the end way at the front of the room and there's some people way at the back of the room. Well, those get to those get at these quality of life issues. So like my wife gave an assessment to one kid one time, you know, asking him these things. And what it came back was basically my life sucks. I have nothing I look forward to. Uh, I have one parent. I go home and I pretty much eat dinner if I'm lucky and then I go to bed. What do you do for fun? There's nothing. You know, this is somebody I would start worrying about because this is somebody who's describing a life that has nothing to lose. And I think that that would be my most important thing for uh, children. The other one regarding PBIS, pardon me, teaching people how to handle aversives. People do not know how to handle aversives anymore. They freak out. A lot of them get uh, super sensitive, flip out about a tiny amount of work, flip out about something wrong said to them. And it's not that uh, this is not a comment um, about um, like, uh, you know, the Me Too movement where people complain about something that is needs to be complained about and is a genuine problem. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people's general ability to handle adversity. I don't mean to be exposed to horrible things and deal with it. I mean the day-to-day -day things that we all have to suffer through, right? Somebody chewed you out at work. Somebody gave you a hard time. Somebody made a smart aleck comment at you. Uh, you know, you did get de or rejected by somebody. You asked somebody out and they said no. All these kinds of things. How do you handle these things? What do you do? What do you do if you get teased? What do you do if a teacher is kind of nasty to you? How do you handle that? Do you know the difference between being aggressive and assertive? Do you know who to talk to? Is there anybody you can talk to? You know, all these kinds of things that might be a motivator or a number of motivators for a school shooter. How are children taught to handle these things? And most of the times the answer is they're not. They're not how to – there's no curriculum in school. What do you do when someone you like – you know, kind of like as a boyfriend, girlfriend doesn't like you back. What do you do? It's not taught in school, right? Should be. You know, I, I think there should be, especially for very young children, teaching things like empathy, teaching things how to handle when things are bad. Here's another thing, teaching this about people. People who do bad things don't deserve to be treated badly. You know, P even people who do bad things deserve to be treated humanely. This is what we feel as a behavior analyst. So this is kind of like an important thing to teach children as well. Like we, here's how I explain it to people. If a child with a disability bites you, you don't get usually angry at the child, bite them back, hold it against them, call them names, sue them, do all these things. But if somebody from the general population does that, 
you'll probably do all those things. And my question is, what's really the difference? You know, you, 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 you demonstrated the ability to be harmed by somebody and not harm them back and not take it personally. We've all demonstrated this ability with young children, but we make a decision that if it's a grown up and they know what they're doing, now we're going to be angry. And just but, for the listener, Merrill used air quotes when he said quotes, know what they're doing. Know what they're doing. Oh, well, it, I say that because a lot of staff will say that. Oh, Matt knows what he's doing because after he slaps me, he laughs. OK, <laughs> right. he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and the thing is, when I tacked your behavior as you are self-aware, now I blame you. Now I'm angry at you. If you were nonverbal, I wouldn't be angry. And here's my point. You've already demonstrated the ability to not be angry. You're making a decision to be angry based on what you know about the person. And my point is you don't need to be angry and mean to them, just like you're not angry and mean to somebody with special needs. Why would you need to do that with someone who doesn't have special needs? Simply because they deserved it, because they know better. I used air quotes again. Uh, <laughs> but does that make sense? Yeah. So, no, uh, it's so, uh, so funny. I've, I've, wh- I've had those discussions with so many people throughout my career in terms of the, the they're doing it on purpose. Yeah. And I... I uh, putting the on purpose, of course, in air quotes uh, again. And uh, yeah, it's an overdeveloped sense of justice. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is that parents need to teach their children. Teachers need to teach their students. When somebody does something bad, we don't say he's a bad person. We say this. He did something that's not nice. He's probably not very happy. Let's see if we can figure out how to make this person happier. Right. What if you just did that instead? Anytime somebody was bad, instead of parents telling their children, well, he's a nasty little child and he'll get his, which, by the way, is what a lot of people say to make their children feel better. And my point is, why do you want to teach your children the way to feel better is by tearing someone else down and saying they're evil and you hope something bad befalls them because that is the same mentality that helps to build a school shooter. You all suck. You all were bad to me. You all don't deserve to live. Right. This is this is the terrorist. This is the school shooter. Right. The other part is valuing one's own life. My life sucks. My life doesn't matter. Why should yours matter? I don't think it does. I don't think anyone's does. And if that's kind of like where you are, that's also a very dangerous thing as well. So I think that I think people just kind of have ignored this whole thing of, hey, every one of these school shooters None of them had a good life. None of them had a good life. None of them. It's not like everything was going right for this guy. <laughs> he had everything. You know, he had a scholarship to MIT. He was the captain of the football team. And then he shot up the whole school. I'm waiting for that one. I haven't seen it yet. Right. You know, so I think that's I think that's the unnamed giant. That, that That's the elephant in the room. Really. Yeah, for sure. You know, the, gun, the guns make it worse, Matt. The guns undeniably make it worse. But the fundamental issue of I'm a young white male angry at the world and don't care about the lives of anyone, that is the problem. That's, that's, the, the, that's root, the danger right there. That's the root cause, in my opinion. You know, the guns... The guns is, are the gasoline on the proverbial fire is what the guns are. That's, nice. that's my analogy. Got it. Got um, it. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think we covered this this uh, issue uh, uh, fairly thoroughly here. Is there anything? I, I have one last question for you that's kind yeah, of sure. unrelated. But uh, before we leave mass shootings, is there anything else that we haven't uh, brought up that you typically want to convey to um, audiences when you talk about this? Uh, yeah, let me just see if there's uh, anyone saying, um, you know, I, I think that, again, just to emphasize to them that it's it's not that, um, you know, mental illness cannot play a role in these kinds of things. But I want everyone to remember specifically, these are not individuals who don't understand what they did or they were hallucinating or something like that. These are people that don't value something the rest of us value. And they value something very different that we don't understand. And because we cannot understand that, we retreat to the only explanation is your brain's not right. And my point is that is for the person who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, was his brain not right? I don't think anybody would say that. But that person, even though they were following orders, they did a horrific thing. Right. And but we... We were in agreement with it back then, and we understood it. 
And because we were in agreement with it and we understood it, nobody said the pilot was mentally ill. Right. But what what if the pilot did it, but he wasn't under orders? Well, now he's got to be crazy. Right. So and, and by the way, that's exactly what people would say if somebody tried to do that. Not under orders. But if you do it under orders, you're a hero. You do it not under orders. You're insane. But I mean, you know, that's what people would say. Sure. So it's, it's, I just think it's an interesting how it controls our verbal behavior. Oh, con- when we, context when we, is everything, right? Context is king, man. Context is king. Uh, but I think that's what I had to say on that. Also, if people wanted it, again, they could uh, either email me. It's Merrill at PCMA.com, M-E-R-R-I-L-L at PCMA.com. I'll be happy to send you the PDF or uh, Matt has it on his uh, Facebook page also. Yeah, I can link it in the show notes of this episode. So you can go to behavioralobservations.com. And uh, I will also be sure to mention it at the top of uh, in, in the introductory comments when we publish this episode. So cool. All right, Merrill, random segue here, but it's a question <laughs> I love asking guests, uh, especially someone like yourself who's been at this for a little while. Um, what is your advice for a newly minted BCBA? Ah, very good. Okay. Here, here, here would be my advice. Um, that, uh, because when you're newly minted and this happened to me as well, you come out with a lot of rule governed behavior. Do this, do that. If they have autism, use this procedure. This procedure is good for that. What procedure do you use for this behavior? What's a good procedure for this problem? Try to put all those things you were taught aside just for a moment. When you see a kid, pretend you know nothing about behavioral terms or functional analysis. Just watch and don't try to categorize what the child is doing too quickly. Because if you do, you might stick something in the wrong box. Just try to say, what are they doing in regular words? Don't say, well, it looks like he did this because he got attention from the teacher. Don't say that. Say he slapped his face. The teacher turned around and she scrunched her face up. That's what you say. You don't try to label it as what category of behavior it belongs and what function it belongs. Don't try and do that yet. Just try to understand what the hell is going on. Just put behavior analysis aside for a second. You're just a smart person who's a good observer and you know nothing about behavior analysis. And instead of formulating your opinions and letting your bias operate that you were taught to use, just practice being a good observer of humans. Just watch them, watch what they do, watch what happens, Make a note of it. Don't be so quick to say what it is. And don't be so quick to say what to do about it. Just figure out what are you looking at. Then later, go put names on it. Just talk about it like a regular person at first. Well, he slapped his face, and then the teacher got really pissed. I'd rather you did that than say it's attention maintained. Because the teacher getting really pissed, that's a fact. It's attention maintained? That's a theory. So this is what i'd suggest and don't be initially everybody has to kind of stay inside the box my sister um used to paint and um she said about being an artist and fox talks about behavioral artistry and i do it with music too when you're first learning something you stay inside the box okay you don't draw outside the lines and because you don't you don't know enough yet to start freewheeling it once you get kind of familiar with stuff, you get good. Then you go outside the box, which is most of what I do when I do my consults. I'm, I'm not doing what I was taught to do. I'm doing other things that I've learned are useful. Um, but I can always ground it back into basic principles. But if you start going outside the box instantly before you've mastered the basics, then you start running off the rails. So like uh, uh, Picasso was able to do what he could do, right, and um, – But not until he knew the basic rules of perspective and how to draw and all this. Then you make uh, melty watches and crazy looking landscapes and things way out of proportion. But that was after he already knew how to do things perfectly. Then he started bending the rules and breaking the rules. So initially, everybody is more rule bound. True. Um, Don't let the rules determine everything. Um, because rules can create insensitivity to the contingencies. And so if you let the rules run roughshod over your interpretive behavior, you may miss a lot of things. 
So that's that's probably the best thing I can say. Oh, I like that a lot. It makes me feel like now because oftentimes when I'll do an observation in a classroom, I'll I'll just open a Word document and just start making bullet like bullet points, and I just kind of and, and so I you know I I'm not doing the your typical ABC recording or whatever. I'll just make notes of like what you're saying. So, so yeah, I, I feel I, a lot better as a result of that. Sometimes, it, oh, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, I do a lot of what I do now is um, I'm doing maybe like a pediatrician who's seen 15,000 kids with whooping cough. Like when I see them, every question I ask is extremely pointed. And within five questions, if I suspect what's going on, I'll have it nailed in five questions and I know what's going on. But it's only because I've seen a thousand of these. Sure. And this looks like another one of these. And all my questions are doing are confirming my hypothesis about this kid. Um, but you can only do that after you've done it like a long time. And then you start seeing similarities across cases and children. And, you know, because there's not a million behavior problems. They're all related. Right. And after a while, You've seen most of them and you know when they're equivalent and, you know, it becomes a lot easier, um, doing that. But yeah, that's what I'd say for the, for the newly minted guys. You know, don't, don't draw outside the lines too much to begin with till you get really good with it. But, you know, also don't be too quick to label what things are because, you know, that may distract you from what the problem is. Like some kids, the problem is not that he wants attention. The problem is that he likes angry people. A functional analysis is not geared to discover weird reinforcers, right? So the problem is not how you get attention. The problem is you love pissed off people. This is what the problem is. And the way you piss people off is by doing bad things, not by doing good things. So is the real problem your bad behavior? No, that's a symptom. The real problem is you like pissing people off. And if you didn't like that, if you liked making people smile, you wouldn't be doing these bad things. So you see what I'm saying? So like yeah, the functional yeah. analysis, the functional analysis will miss that boat completely. Well, there's a great so, paper yeah. that actually looked at that from the nineties. I think it was a Wayne Fisher and, uh, mm-hmm. the Fisher and Piazza, mm. uh, and others, I think, uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll link to, I'll, I'll dig up and I'll link to in the show notes of this episode, but they looked at different types of verbal attention contingent upon problematic behavior. And, uh, that's some stuff we had, had done, um, kind of uh more more indirectly when i was um working at that institutional setting i i mentioned earlier uh that yeah it's kind of interesting when you say pissing people off as a reinforcer i i i get it man i get it so meryl uh, this has been uh this has been fantastic right. um i i, I will we'll definitely have to schedule a part two on restraint uh and, oh, yeah uh, and, and don't forget white explaining racism that's got to happen too or, yes, uh, otherwise known as the uh, the career Matt and Merrill the career ender <laughs> terminate. We'll terminate our careers simultaneously. We'll have to do that. Uh, yeah, we'll have to do that one at ABAI so we can like you know have a beer afterwards or something like that'd that. That'd be great. Be, we'll uh, by to, the way, we'll I am, I'm doing a short version of this talk at ABAI with uh, Jeannie Golden and, and in a symposium on empathy. Oh, cool. So do you? Yeah, um, like, do, you, do you, yeah. Send me the link to that, and I'll put that in the show notes of this episode as well. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. It was oh, this, fun. This has been super fun. Thanks, Meryl. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.